Today's scripture reading is from the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. It will be found on page 737 in the Hebrew. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them, they sacrificed them to Balaam and burned incense to the living from Egypt. I called Ephraim also together, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I drew them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke and their jobs, and I laid me upon them. He shall not return to the land of Egypt, and the Assyrian shall be his king, because they refuse to return. And the sword shall abide in his cities, and shall consume his branches, and devour them without their own conflict. And my people are bent to backsliding from me, for they call them to the most high, not at all for the selfie. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adam? How shall I set thee as Zebulun? My heart is coming within me. My repentance, my repentance, my repentance, my yes. I will not execute the fierceness of my mind. I will not return to destroy effort. For I am God, and not man. The Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar after the Lord. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the rest. They shall tremble as a bird out of the sea, and as a dove out of the land of the sea. And I will place them in their houses, saith the Lord. The word of the Lord. The New Testament reading today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Jesus is teaching the disciples and the crowds through the parable of the rich fool. Listen for the word of God. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Let us pray. Dear God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Up in Gloucester, on the wild and rocky north shore of Boston last weekend, I met a young woman. In her mid-twenties, she told me a story. While she was in her sleek black wetsuit, preparing to surf. Now, granted, surfing and barns don't usually figure in the same stories. And this sermon is entitled, Building Bigger Barns. So there we are in the surf, in the spray in the sand. And there's no barn in her story. Yet, barn building is what the Holy Spirit was describing for me. 
as I listened amidst the saltwater spray, soaking in her words, and aware of the very presence of God. She said, after college in the Midwest, this young woman spent seven years in Ecuador working with a mission agency, building challenge courses alongside the local youth and youth leaders as part of her ministry. Not to store up possession on earth, but to build up the body of Christ. And in this rough and tumble process, she learned everyday Spanish in order to pair the gospel of Christ, the spoken word, with her actions, the visible word for Christ's kingdom. And then her story began to move from these facts to colorful description, and I settled in. When she arrived, she found that church youth leaders were typically handed 50 youth and left on their own, no resources. And the mission agency came in and asked a question, a specific question of the youth leaders. What do you need to be a better youth leader to bring the love of Christ to these kids? And the answer was, a place to take the youth. Many had never been out of the congested city with the smog and the crime and oppression. And so a dream was fostered of building a retreat facility with the goal of fostering deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, both through the building process and in the result. And their theme verse, which her eyes lit up when she shared with me, was Hosea 2.14. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. So this mission agency, they looked at a proposed site and thought it way too big for their meager resources, both in finances and in volunteers. It was far beyond the scope of their mission. Now, honestly, a shack would have been more realistic. And maybe, maybe they could work toward an awning to just enlarge the meeting space a little bit. For a start. But a nudging from the Holy Spirit during their prayer time prompted these missionaries to dream large and to share their vision with the property owners. With the sum total of their entire treasury tucked in one man's pocket, this crumpled and worn $20 bill, they ended up with 300 acres of land. Once on the property, they were overwhelmed by what they had walked into. It's a little scary when you get to pray for. They, they did find a workable infrastructure. They found some outbuildings. And then, wonder of wonders, there was electricity and running water. What this meant for them is that they wouldn't have to deal with bribes in the government and all their dreams potentially going for naught because of water and because of electricity. Unfound treasures down there. Overgrown trails were uncovered and a refuge was created. Now the young lady telling me this story moved from a sense of wonder of God's provision to an excitement in the retelling of the old, old story of God's love for all creation, sending Jesus to save humanity and reconcile us with God and with one another. Her part in this ongoing story was the building of a challenge course, low ropes, high ropes, to lead the youth in team building, to trust God, and to teach them to trust God and his children as community of faith. Stretching high up on her tiptoes, she fashioned platforms onto trees. And bending and twisting, she tied ropes into intricate and strong elements. Engaging with the local youth in the process, teaching and sharing the gospel, and robustly singing in broken but earnest Spanish. She was sweating and tired and very weary at the end of every single day. And yet, she kept showing up for seven years. Taller trees and wider boundaries 
became home base for this ministry. Raising higher, building bigger. These were themes I heard repeated in this story of physical challenges. Minimal resources. People hungry for God. Not higher or bigger to contain, but to raise thoughts to God through the hands and the hearts of God's people. First, God acts with love. And then we respond with thanksgiving, in praise and in worship. And what is worship? Worship is what we do together when we gather, when we gather around the Word. And worship is what we do when we go out in the world to serve God. We often call that part mission. Mission is how we live as a church, engaging with our neighbors, helping them build their barns for sustenance and for life with God. When folks are in need of community, we show up. In my grandparents' day, it might have been for an old-fashioned barn raising, where the side of the barn was built laying in the field, and the neighbors working together to raise it up into place. Nowadays, Christian community response to difficult days might look like author Anne Lamont describes in her book, Traveling Mercies. We show up. We bring food. We walk the dog. We listen. We let them cry and cry and cry. We do the laundry. We keep showing up. And that, she says, is how we build a barn. Covenant Connected Community. At baptism, our parents and our church promise to nurture and guide us in the Christian faith. And then at confirmation class, we offer our own confession and profession of faith. And along the journey, we learn to be joyful, faithful members of this body of Christ. This is a relational faith. We are not meant to go it alone. When the rich man in the parable pondered his question, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops, he settled on preservation of self and wealth over engagement with the riches of community. Now, being wealthy is not the problem in this parable. The problem is in forgetting who is our creator and our sustainer. The first question of the larger Westminster Catechism asks, what is the chief end of humans? And the answer is, to glorify God and enjoy God forever. When we seek after God with wholehearted abandon, our riches will be a joy to share for the good works that have been prepared in advance by God for us to do. But we try to get it right. We mess up. We try again. And we are humbled by our own sin. And we recognize that no matter how big our personal barns, we need Jesus, our Savior, who died for us on the cross. And we turn from looking at our barns as containing and begin to shift our gaze upward. The Holy Spirit fills us, encourages us, and quiets us. And we find new joy in this life together on earth in community with God and with one another. Who in this church, in this community, or across the world might you share such joy with today? A church member who lives alone and would so enjoy an invitation to brunch or a picnic and some lively conversation. A community member going through a hard time who shows up at the soup kitchen needing both food and affirmation of human dignity and worth. A Hurricane Sandy rebuilding project whose volunteer team has found that their once exciting endeavor has ground to a slow halt as it is mostly forgotten in the march of time and other headlines, such as naming the royal baby. At Holmes Presbyterian Camp, 
our own Presbytery's treasure just up the road near Carmel. Wonderful folks are sharing Christ around campfires in real and life-changing ways each day this summer. Might you offer your skills on a project? There is always a project at camp. Might you fund a campership or simply commit to praying for the camp and the staff and the campers this summer? Hiking through Holmes Camp at the height of the summer season, I was again, once again, just struck. Oh, I was struck by the joy of Christians sharing their faith with one another, energetically singing grace around breakfast, creatively setting up a low-impact, woodsy campsite, working side-by-side in the organic farm, and at peace in the quiet song of evening vespers. Today, a team travels to Haiti for the One Small House initiative. And many of you here today have supported this initiative financially, with your elbow grease, with your prayers. In word and act, our lives are being lifted to God as a community of faith. How might we be drawn closer to the flame as we offer our gifts and talents? My grandparents lived on a farm in Bay City, Michigan. Each summer, my family went out for a visit. Preparations for the journey and rituals along the way have come to symbolize for me ways to build community, to build bigger barns, to share the joy of welcoming both friends and strangers into the household of God. Step one on this trip to Bay City, Michigan unearthing the camper from the back corner of the garage and opening it up to ready it for the trip. We each stood in excitement for this magical moment, and my job was to duck under the sides as they were pulled out and insert the metal supports as my dad held the sides up with his very capable and work-loved hands. And this small, square, metal became a tent, with room for an entire family, and our friends came to explore and play inside. Step two, to get ready for the trip. After packing up the station wagon, into the kind with a wood panel on the side, we hitched up the camper, and we headed out before dawn. We eventually arrived at our assigned campsite in the Adirondack Mountains. We set up camp, and one of my jobs was to welcome the neighbors in a very special way. I was given a paper plate and markers. And I was to color the plate, writing our family name and our city and our state. So it said, Heron, Rye, New York. And when we posted this plate up on the tree, it had the effect of a welcome mat on the ground outside the camper. We created community. New friends were made, and the joys of nature were celebrated together. Our campsite became a bigger barn. Step three, we made our way up to Michigan about a week later. And again, we opened the camper. And this time, it was in a field, out by the farmhouse, by the rows of corn, and, you guessed it, by the barn. And when we threw open the canvas flap in the front of the camper door, the cousins came. And in they peeked. We said, come in. And the circle grew wider again. And step four, the annual rediscovery of the barn. My grandparents and their relatives and friends and neighbors had built the barn first. When my mother was born, even before constructing the farmhouse, and generations later, the barn welcomed us kids to play in the dusty oats, to climb up on the red tractor with its cracked leather seat, and to connect with those who had gone before us. A camper, a paper plate welcome sign, a barn big enough for hard work and play, for fellowship and connection. Where are your barns, and what might you do with them? In these lazy days of August, 
a time apart from the burst of energy that crisp September brings. Let us live out our promises to nurture one another in grateful response to the love and mercy that we have been shown. Let us pray. Lord God, creator and sustainer of all, we turn our desires over to you, that our barns might be generous, welcoming, loving places to welcome Jesus in our midst. Amen.